Next, from the City Club of Chicago, Illinois Senate President John Cullerton talks about the revenues and spending that lawmakers will have to work with as they try to create a new budget and resolve Illinois' fiscal crisis. This runs about 25 minutes. This is my sixth City Club address, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to discuss key matters of public policy during my time as uh, Senate President. But I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce the uh, colleagues of mine. Uh, I'm particularly honored to have with me uh, my Republican counterpart, the Republican leader, Christine Rodonio. Senator Rodonio, thank you very much. Uh, also with us is a colleague who's running for statewide office. He's a senator from Champaign. Uh, I don't know if you can see him here. It's um, <laughs> Senator, Senator Frerichs. Would you please stand up, Senator Frerichs? <laughs> senator Frerichs. The uh, Senate President Pro Tem, Don Harmon, is here. Senator Harmon, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Daniel Biss, thank you very much, Senator Biss, for being here. From the western suburbs, Senator Bertino Tarrant, Jennifer Bertino Tarrant. The district next to mine, Senator Heather Staines. Senator Staines. One of our leaders, Maddie Hunter. Senator Maddie Hunter is here. Thank you, Maddie. Another leader, Terry Link. Senator Terry Link is here. <laughs> Senator John Mulrow. John Mulrow from the Northwest Side. Uh, a freshman senator from Lake County doing a great job, Senator Melinda Bush. <laughs> senator Dan Katowski. Senator Katowski. <laughs> Another leader, Senator Kimberly Lightford. Kimberly. The first Democrat to be elected senator from DuPage County, Senator Tom Cullerton. Now, there may have been some senators who came in after. Who did I miss? S senator Cunningham is here. And from the south side. And another leader, Senator Donnie Trotter. Thank you very much, Donnie. Now, I did not want to introduce people from the lower chamber. I thought Jay was going to have them you know, stand up and introduce themselves, but none did, right? So is Louis Arroyo here? Oh, okay, Senator, Representative Louis Arroyo. He's not a senator. Some of you have heard me make this introduction before, but I am uniquely qualified to do it. I'm the President of the Illinois Senate. Allow me to introduce the Speaker of my House, Pam Cullerton. And there's one more Cullerton here to introduce, our oldest daughter, Maggie Cullerton. Maggie, thank you very much for coming. So I recently celebrated my fifth anniversary as President of the Senate, and many of you know it's been a busy five years and it doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon. The General Assembly is facing some very big issues in 2014. So what I'd like to do today is first review briefly the last five years to give you a snapshot of what the General Assembly has done. Then I'd like to speak about the new state pension law, which we passed in December and is now before the courts. And finally, I'd like to talk about one of the most urgent problems facing us today. That's the underfunding of the Chicago Public School pension system. So we've distributed highlights of the work we've done in Springfield since I became Senate President in 2009. I think it's important that we remember the condition we were in then compared to where we are now. Hopefully we can appreciate uh, just how much progress has been made knowing that more, more can be done. If you want to know more about these and other accomplishments, I would encourage you to visit our website. I'm going to mention this uh, website only because uh, We've been very proud of it. The Illinois Senate Democrats.com, uh, in that website, our 14 new laws for 2014 presentation has had more than 1.2 million uh, views since we posted it. There's also a comprehensive section of legal research on state pensions in the Illinois Constitution, as well as information on our new concealed carry law. Uh, and by the way, this, these remarks will be uh, posted there soon. 
Uh, so if you haven't gone, check it out and let us know what you think. So my message to you today is that our state continues to face challenges, but I'm optimistic that we can and will address them because that's what we've been doing the past five years. And let me walk you through some examples. So when I was elected Senate President, at a very difficult time in our state's history, our governor had been arrested. Lehman Brothers had collapsed two months before. Our deficit was growing, our infrastructure was crumbling, and Springfield was at a standstill with gridlock that resembles what we're seeing in Washington today. In fact, after the pomp and circumstance surrounding the inauguration, the Senate immediately commenced the former governor's impeachment trial. We took this task seriously. We researched presidential and judicial impeachment trials and crafted new rules on a bipartisan basis that allowed for a deliberative process. We knew this wasn't just about Ron Magojevich. This was setting a precedent. And the public noticed. Our process received acclaim from pundits and everyday citizens alike. These impeachment proceedings happened at a time when states across the nation were experiencing financial hardship as a result of the worst economic downturn in recent history. This challenge was the first of many bipartisan efforts that the legislature would act on in five years. We worked to rebuild not only the public's trust post Blagojevich, but also to revamp ethics rules that were out of date. We approved the first ever limits on campaign contributions in state races, updated the Freedom of Information Act to make government respond faster, changed procurement rules, and purged state boards of Blagojevich appointees. We also broke a decade-long stalemate and passed the largest public works program in the country by investing in crumbling roads, dilapidated bridges, and unsafe schools. In 2009, all 50 states combined to invest $39 billion towards infrastructure needs. Illinois accounted for $31 billion of that total. More than 439,000 people have been employed here as a result. And faced with escalating pension payments, we took the first of several steps to restore financial security to the retirement funds. Two years before California's highly acclaimed pension reform law, we created a retirement plan for new hires, one that reduces benefits and generally makes employees work longer to qualify for pensions. That plan saves taxpayers more than $250 billion in accrued liability over the next three decades. We faced a tough challenge right here in Chicago. <clears throat> at, at a time when McCormick Place was losing shows to Orlando and Las Vegas, we took on the unions and even a veto from the governor to overhaul work rules and restore the convention industry's faith in McCormick Place. These changes brought more business to Chicago and kept more union workers employed at the convention halls. Now back in 2002, I began working with then State Senator Barack Obama to implement death penalty reforms. And in 2011, the General Assembly outlawed executions in Illinois. Also in 2011, we passed a comprehensive education accountability package. That legislation lengthened the school day and year in Chicago. It also tied school staffing decisions and teacher tenure to higher performance standards. It ended the practice of last hired, first fired, and made it easier to remove underperforming teachers from the classroom. We then went on to change workers' compensation laws to improve our business climate by reducing employer cost while preserving workers' rights. We're already seeing positive results. Since that law passed, the National Council on Compensation Insurance has called for rate reductions totaling 13.3%. We've reined in the growing cost of the state's Medicaid program by approving the SMART Act which reduced eligibility for benefits, weeded out fraud, and also raised our cigarette tax. The $2.7 billion program was the largest savings our budget has seen in decades and transformed the Medicaid program. Now that's a budget savings of more than double the savings of the recent pension reform law. We've also worked to preserve access to health care for those who need it most by taking advantage of early enrollment under the Affordable Care Act. So now approximately 342,000 low-income Illinoisans between the age of 19 and 64 gain coverage through the Medicaid program funded entirely by the federal government. 
By now, everyone is aware of how central <coughs> the uh, immigration debate was in the last presidential election. In a few weeks after the election, as Congress remained stalled on immigration reform, Republicans in Illinois joined us in passing a law to ensure that immigrant drivers are trained, tested, licensed, and insured through the Temporary Visitors Driver's License Program. In 2011, we passed civil unions. The world did not end. <laughs> and so, just last year, we built on that foundation by passing the Religious Freedom and Marriage Fairness Act, which brought marriage equality to Illinois. All families will be recognized equally with the same rights, protections, and respect. We kept five years of accomplishments by passing a pension reform compromise onto the courts for judicial review. More on that in a bit. <clears throat> I'm also proud that over the past five years, the legislature has partnered with many of the businesses and people in this room to spur economic development. For example, when Navistar restructured operations, it not only stayed here in Illinois, it added jobs, many of which came from the great state of Indiana. We've helped attract 1,100 new jobs to the Ford plant on the south side of Chicago, which added a third shift and new products to the line. With the passage of the 2011 Smart Grid Law, ComEd has begun to spend $2.6 billion as part of a 10-year investment to modernize the electric grid in northern Illinois. ComEd has already created over 2,700 jobs because of this law. And in downstate Illinois, Ameren, another one of the state's utilities, is investing $1 billion that will create 600 new jobs. People's Gas will also invest billions to upgrade its infrastructure while maintaining 1,000 full-time jobs. These are just some examples of why one of Illinois' best economic indices, the University of Illinois Institute of Government and Public Affairs Flash Index, is at a post-recession high and the highest level since April 2007. So people want to do business in Illinois, and they are doing business in Illinois. We have great assets. We have an educated workforce, our local communities, house world-class tourist attractions, natural resources, and transportation hubs. By working with local leaders like Mayor Rahm Emanuel, we've passed some major legislation that built upon these assets. So if I could quickly reflect on the impact some of these are having right here in Chicago. The reforms for McCormick Place continue to bring tourism revenue to the city. Our construction program made critical investments in Chicago. For example, Wacker Drive's renovations received $284 million, while the Lakeshore Drive project received another $40 million. And we've invested an additional $2.5 billion to benefit those who ride the CTA and Metro. Our public safety laws make the city safer. Our education reforms are improving the quality of our teachers and are benefiting our students while keeping them in the classroom for an additional hour. Recent reports show that in 2013, Chicago Public School students received the highest graduation rate on record. And the Chicago Public School system has four of the top five high schools in Illinois as well as eight of the top ten elementary schools, including the top six in the state. So I know that sometimes, sometimes, these accomplishments mistakenly get left out of all dramatic press releases. <laughs> but the truth is that it's the state legislature that's the body that actually passed these laws. So while we celebrate the recent positives surrounding Chicago, we are, however, painfully aware that the city's looming pension debt could destroy everything we've worked so hard to accomplish. The General Assembly, though, has demonstrated that we can solve big problems when we work together. Past five years have seen more action on stabilizing our pension systems than any point in our state's history. We've made our full pension payment every year. We've made reforms for new employees and approved Senate Bill 1, a negotiated reform to address current workers and retirees. Now many of you may want to know why I supported that final plan. The short answer is this. I'm not on the Supreme Court. Uh, while I think there are some real constitutional questions about the validity of the law, it is clear that the only way to settle those questions is through the judicial process. But there's another reason why I felt it was time to advance that plan. We can now focus on what I would deem a true crisis. I am, after all, a Chicago resident and a taxpayer, and our public school pension system is in dire need of help. The story behind the pension funding crisis facing Chicago and its teachers, pension fund starts in 1995. 
And that year, the General Assembly passed the Chicago uh, School Reform Law, and that law did several things both at the state and at the city levels that caused the current situation. At the state level, the 1995 law carried with it a promise that the state would chip in as much as 30% of what it was contributing to the TRS. That's the retirement system that covers downstate and suburban teachers. That promise was never kept. As you can see from this slide, the contributions to Chicago are in red. The contributions to the TRS are in blue. Can you see the red? It's really small. <laughs> in our current budget, the state's contribution to the suburban and downstate teachers' pension fund is $3.4 billion. That's billion with a B. The contribution to the Chicago fund is $11.9 million. That's a million with an M. So keep in mind, Chicago's teachers represent 18% of all the teachers in Illinois. This means that for every state dollar allocated for downstate and suburban teachers' pensions, Chicago teachers receive less than a penny. In other words, if you live in Chicago, then you're getting, hitting, you're getting hit twice for pensions. Your property tax dollars fund the Chicago teachers' pensions, while your income tax dollars go to fund the downstate and suburban teachers' pensions. Now, at the city level, the underfunding of Chicago teachers' pensions, as with the state pension system, is one of shared blame. As you can see from this chart, in 1995, at the far left there, uh, the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund was over 80% funded. By state law, <coughs> the fund also had its own separate property tax levy. The same 1995 school reform law that I mentioned earlier repealed that separate tax levy and redirected those dollars into the Chicago Public Schools operating budget. The law also required the fund to maintain 90% funding and allowed the Chicago Public Schools to skip pension payments in years where the fund exceeded 90%. So because of stock market gains, the fund was over 90% between 1996 and 2003. This allowed the Chicago Public Schools to skip pension payments during those years. Uh, they did not resume making those pension contributions until 2006 when the fund was 78% funded. As a result, between 1996 and 2005, over $2 billion that would have otherwise gone into the pension fund was redirected in the Chicago Public Schools operating budget. And a significant amount of that money went to pay for several years of Chicago teacher salary increases that greatly exceeded inflation. If that money had been paid into the fund, then the pension system would be about 70% funded, not 50% funded as it is now. And to make matters worse, even though the Chicago Public Schools resumed making pension payments between 2006 and 2010, it received from the legislature partial pension payment holidays in 2011, 12, and 13, and the fund's 90% goal was pushed back <clears throat> from 2045 to 2059. The point of all this is Chicago schools have a problem and we need to act now. By the end of June, Chicago Public Schools will owe a $613 million pension payment to the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. That payment is $417 million more than last year's payment. State law limits the Chicago Public Schools' ability to close this gap by raising property taxes. That means the bulk of the money comes uh, likely out of the classroom, resulting in drastic teacher layoffs and increased class sizes. That's not acceptable for a world-class city like ours. Slashing educational opportunities will not move our city forward. It's really a formula for failure. So let's follow the model of forging bipartisan solutions at the state level and figure out how to solve this together. We need a plan that's fair in its approach, has an improved chance of success in court, and provides enough savings so future pension payments are manageable. We should also follow a similar path towards reform that we've used for other pension systems, where labor and management work together. I know firsthand that forging a solution with workers is meaningful and possible. I urge the Chicago Public School System and its teachers union to do the same. So I look forward to working with the mayor and the legislative leaders as we tackle what I hope will be one of our most meaningful accomplishments. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, the, the, I think the question is that uh, there's been some proposals to uh, start with uh, 401ks for all new employees. Uh, when you do that, uh, they stop paying into the pension system. 
uh, and yet you still have an obligation for all the people who are in the pension system now. So actually it costs more money uh, initially, a lot more money, uh, billions of dollars. So that would not alleviate our, our uh, financial problems. Boy, I'll tell you, after Perfect. that talk, you would think there'd be, I mean, not all of you are elected officials. I'm happy. This is yeah. great. <laughs> the professor has a question. Didn't write it down only because, remember, I'm, I'm suffering here. All that stuff at the beginning was so rosy. Why doesn't Moody's and all the other rating agencies agree with you? Well, um, I, I would just say I think it's appropriate that we, after five years, have an opportunity to uh, explain to people what we've been doing down there. And obviously things are getting better. Uh, I think they are, and I, I think these are backed up by the statistics that we have uh, uh, researched, um, but there are, in a political season, uh, folks that are motivated to, uh, you know, get a political advantage, and sometimes they um, uh, they don't uh, accurately, I would say, explain some of the positive things. So that's part of politics. But I think that we've obviously made a lot of uh, changes that are making us uh, do an excellent job. We've been paying down our bills dramatically. We're down to a point where um, the bills that we were something like $12 billion um, uh, behind on our bills. Now we're down close to, I think, about four by the end of this fiscal year. That's been very positive. Um, obviously, the pensions uh, reforms were Im very important. The Medicaid bill that we passed that I mentioned uh, saved a dramatic amount of money. And it's almost as if uh, people don't even know we passed it. But it's very significant. It'll keep uh, us uh, saving money uh, in future years as well. So I think the rating agencies should really take a second look uh, and see what we've uh, accomplished in the last five years. Michael Kassa, Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation. What are the chances that there will be legislation to amend the EDGE tax credit program and what might that changes look like? Okay. A good question. I yeah, every, every state in the nation tries to promote uh, itself and create jobs. And so you cannot uh, unilaterally uh, disarm yourself and say we're not going to do that. So we have the edge tax credit, and we have a number of other incentives that I mentioned that, to, that have, have brought jobs into Illinois. What we need to do, and I agree with the speaker on this, we need to have a template, and I, Senator Rodonio and I have talked about this. We need to have uh, kind of a model so we know how to evaluate people's request for incentives, because uh, everybody could come to us and say, oh, we need to, you, for you to give us some kind of a tax break, and we have to decide, you know, uh, ourselves quickly on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not that's a good idea or not. So we, we need to develop some uh, templates so we can have a better idea. Uh, but obviously we're going to be in the business because creating jobs and improving the business climate is the most important issue just in, about in every state in the nation. And Obviously we're very interested in doing that as well. well. This is the first time in the history of the City Club that we have two questions from Downers Grove. Uh, <laughs> normally we don't have any. We have two yeah. Okay. Uh, Greg, is that, how do you pronounce your last name, Greg? Jose. Good and word. Village of Donners Grove. Metra's delays. Is Gates still here? Yes, he is. <laughs> Metra's delays during the recent bitter cold are largely the result of antiquated infrastructure. What progress can we expect toward a su sustainable solution for capital needs? So, uh, as I indicated earlier in my remarks, we had Senator Rodonio and I were elected the same day. And uh, we had, it had been uh, the capital bill or the construction uh, program had been delayed because of legislative inaction. So we, in that year, passed this major construction program. And a lot of that money went to the CTA and, uh, and Metra and PACE. Uh, now, it's been five years. Uh, most of that money has been allocated, and there's been uh, people in a bipartisan way have come forward and said it's time to do another uh, capital bill, primarily for transportation. If we do any capital bill for roads, we're, we're also going to include the capital for uh, mass transit. Uh, and so, but it's only going to be done on a bipartisan fashion, just like we did the first one. And obviously, I'm uh, looking forward to working with all of the interest groups to try to do that. And I think after coming through this tough winter, reading about the problems that the Metro still has with its infrastructure, it'll just give incentive for that effort. Thank you. Okay. The Illinois Channel's coverage of the state legislature is underwritten by the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association.